All right. So let's get started. Like I said, uh, welcome to everybody. If you just joined us, my name is Han Song Bay, and we're going to be talking about back to packet trenches. What's packet trenches? Well, these are things that you find in real life. Okay, these are troubleshooting things that happen uh, in real life and various different scenarios. So I, I feel I like to call it, you know, back to the packet trenches because that's where all the nitty gritty sausage making happens. And uh, that's why it's called back to the packet trenches. Now, some contact information, let's take a look. You can find me at LinkedIn. That's the only social media platform I am on. Um, you can't find me anywhere else. So LinkedIn it is, and you can Google my name and I'm sure you can uh, send me an invite, ask me questions there. And a lot of people do ask me questions in LinkedIn, okay? The next link here is my YouTube channel. There's a couple of uh, SharkFest information there. There's some TCP tutorial uh, that's there as well. And then the profiles for Wireshark that I'll use, I'll have it up and available in the HSB Wireshark profile drop box, or box, I should say, link. And um, it'll be available later this afternoon after the session's over. Then this presentation and the packet trace files that I use will also be available in the SharkFest EU21 folder that you see here. Okay. And then finally, if you want to ask me a question, because a lot of people do, in fact, one of these um, trace files was someone who sent me via email saying, hey, I don't really know what the hell's going on. Uh, do you think you can help me? So if you need to get a hold of me, um, this is probably the best way to get a hold of me, my email address. And uh, with that, let's get started. Okay. All right. So I wanted to kind of focus on a very specific topic for this session. And that's um, what causes delays? Well, there are a couple of things that can cause delays. The two major ones are congestion at the network layer and then the TCP window size, of course, right? That should be pretty elementary in terms of troubleshooting window size. And if we have time, we'll get to that. But in the past, I've done a lot of, you know, why is window size important? And I'll just get it off the um, plate here. Window size is important because you can only transfer one full TCP window size per round trip. Okay, so whatever your window size is, the full window, the maximum window size that you have, that's all you can transfer in one round trip time. Okay, and if that doesn't make sense, I want you to Google that um, and read it and think about it because that's a fundamental concept to TCP analysis, okay? Now this session isn't beginner session, uh, but I have walked through this topic of why TCP windows matters uh, in previous sessions, okay? So do check those things out. So let's talk about the other topic, congestion, network congestion. How do we fix it? Can we fix it? Well, you can, they take time, but you can fix it you can buy more bandwidth because congestion occurs when there's congestion, when there's too much, too many packets on the wire, okay? So if you buy a fatter pipe, if you go from 10 meg to 100 meg to one gig to 10 gig to 100 gig, well, you're buying more bandwidth, so the congestion will go away. The other way to address congestion is quality of service. So. I hate quality of service. Um, I will argue anybody that quality of service, the way it's implemented today, is a fundamentally broken technology. And if I ask you, hey, I'm sure there are a lot of network operators out there, network jockeys, and I say, hey, is your QoS good? And you tell me yes, then it's one of two things. You're lying or you don't know that it's broken. Okay. There's a third scenario. Maybe you have five router network and that's manageable. If you have five routers, I will posit that you can have your quality of service um, configurations perfectly configured, okay? But the problem is, is that um, other, if you have five routers, 10 routers, 20 routers, et cetera, then it becomes impossible to manage because quality of service is 
on a per interface basis. And uh, most people, a lot of people that I know try to go for the moon. Okay, they turn it into a rocket launch and they'll say, you know what we need? We need more classes of service. So typically I would say business critical, um, high importance, default and garbage collection. Okay, that's bulk transfers, batch transfers. But then people will go, no, because my business is more important. So I want you to prioritize mine. And then another business, a, a BU will say, no, mine is more important. Prioritize mine. Okay, so as network operators, we are a utility. We're not supposed to care about what goes into the pipes, but that's not the reality. We do have to care. In fact, there is a built-in quality of service for routers, CS6. It uses to protect itself um, when routing updates happen, when you talk to the routers, et cetera. It's a dedicated uh, class of service that DACP value that routers use to protect itself. And the other thing that routers do is if you mistakenly allocate 100%, router says, no, 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 I'm not gonna give you 100% of the bandwidth because I gotta use some of it. So there's actually about 5% protection built in. So even though you think you're using 100%, you're really using you know, high 90s because the router protects itself. So this is why I say quality of service is broken. And I didn't mean to go, on a, go off on a rant, but, um, and someone just you know, wrote here, the best QoS is more bandwidth. Um, that's too, true to a degree, but we don't have infinite bandwidth. Here's the other thing you need to think about and why I say congestion is something you're going to live with uh, forever is TCP fills the pipe. Modern TCP have phenomenally large window sizes. Okay, And in fact, if you go back to previous Wireshark sessions, Jasper had sessions on um, the collapse that happens because of the huge window sizes that... Um, that Windows and other modern servers use, okay? So TCP will find a way to fill the pipe. So you will always have congestion. Um, but the one thing that I will, this is my last rent on quality of service is that QoS only kicks in when there is congestion, okay? So keep that in mind that QoS doesn't even kick in unless there's uh, congestion. It's like a governor. It's a, it's a way to keep check on people. So anyway, this is why I say fundamentally quality of service as it's implemented today is um, broken. One final statement on QoS. This is important because I assume a lot of you manage and operate networks. So a lot of people say, okay, I'm gonna dedicate 10% for this class, 15% for this class, or you can even use actual uh, bits per second, 10 megabits, 100 megabits, et cetera. Here's a problem. At the head end data center, you might have a 10 gig internet. And at the branch, you might have one gigabit. Not too uncommon these days to have 10 gig, one gig at the remote location. 10% of 10% of 10 gig, do the math, right? If you dedicate one class at the head end to say, yeah, I'll give high priority traffic 10%. Well, that 10% is based on my interface speed, which is 10 gig. At the branch, it's one gig. So how does that work? Okay, so that's kind of the, some of the dirty little secrets of quality of service. Okay, but we do have to be able to identify it. And um, if you have the luxury of fixing it, you can fix it. And, and so can it be 100% without... Con um, so no. So yes and no. So the question is, utilization level uh, means congestion to a router. Can it be 100% without congestion? So there is one particular class, low latency queue, that you must always rate limit because that gets that gets a first shot at the interface above and beyond anybody else. Typically, that's used for voice because voice is very jitter sensitive. But you know what? Here's the thing: modern voice over IP have, has come a long way since the original, and it is very fault tolerant to jitter. So before there was a lot of you know stress about voice over IP, you can't have jitter, you can't delay these packets. So make sure you put it into low latency queue and make sure it gets out above, you know, have its own separate um, HOV or high occupancy vehicle or um, 
commute lanes, right? So this is the lanes dedicated for when you have more people in the car. It gets preferential treatment. So that can clog up um, your bandwidth if you don't rate limit it, okay? So, all right, so with that, let's get started on um, how you can fix it. But before we fix it, we have to understand what the hell it is that we're trying to fix in the first place. Um, there are two other delays that we talk about besides congestion, and that's the propagation delay and serialization delay, okay? Those are the two delays that you see on a modern day network. So propagation delay is, you can't really do, or in fact, let me go back to the screen here. So propagation delay is how fast does it get from point A to point B? And I said here, you can sort of kind of fix it because you can buy a faster transmission method, okay? So if you Google it, um, copper, has a certain property about, it's based on speed of light, how fast the electrical sim signal can go from one beginning of the wire to the end of that wire, okay? And that speed is fixed. Now, how do you fix it? Well, it turns out microwave is faster than copper. So if you have a microwave dish and you're transmitting packets through a microwave, you, it'll get to that other side faster because it flies through the air faster than um, even fiber optic cable, okay? So that's really the only uh, way that you can address propagation delay because that's a function of which cable you buy. The other one is serialization delay. Now this one is tight coupled with um, how much bandwidth you have. So what is serialization delay? Serialization delay is how, so if your packet is this big, and here's your transmission uh, line. This packet has to be, remember it's bit by bit by bit, right? So when we say 10 megabits per second, we mean that this byte of data has to get onto this wire one bit at a time, okay? And, and uh, to not to get pedantic, but ethernet is LSB, least significant bit first. Okay, so there's a concept of NDN, big NDN, little NDN. Ethernet transmits the least significant bit first, and, um, but it's one bit at a time. So imagine this packet there, and it goes into the wire to transmit, it's one bit at a time, okay? So this is what the bits look like. This is an Ethernet frame, and everybody understands, have seen this Ethernet, uh, how the frame works, okay? But then I would actually say, do you really know this? And why do you need to know this? Because typically when you look at Wireshark, it'll say, oh, 1500 bytes, 1514 byte packet. But is it 1514? Is it 15 Is it something else? What is it? And why does it matter? So let's take a look at this. So typically when you look at source destination, two bytes of uh, ether type and data up to 1500 bytes, that's 1514, you do the math. That's not really true these days because you TCP options got a little bigger. So the 1500, you have to take away the 1500 bytes to make room for those TCP options. But what about this? Oh, and the other thing is this doesn't include VLANs. So if you use VLANs, it fits right in between here. So that takes away room from your 1500 byte MTU, okay? Maximum transmission unit, 1500 bytes. Remember, this is Ethernet packet. We're not talking TCP IP yet. So what's this frame checksum here, FCS? Well, if you include that, you'll see 1518. This is Ethernet's um, CR, so check to make sure that the frame as it's being transmitted didn't get corrupted. Think of it that way. So it's frame checksum sequence there, four bytes that we have to account for. And then if we look at the preamble and start field delimiter here, that's another 1526. So from the beginning to here, we're not at 1514, not 1500, not 1514, not 1518, we're at 1526, okay? But then what the hell is this 9.6 microseconds? And it says interframe gap, what is that? So um, this is where I wanna tell everybody to go. Remember I always say, try to go one level deeper than your average person. That's, that's the only way you get good at this. And the one level deeper is reading books like Rich Seifert, uh, who wrote Gigabit Ethernet, or Charles Spurgeon, who wrote um, Definitive Guide to Ethernet, I believe it's called. 
And um, I'll have a link to that uh, in my presentation when you download it. I'll remember to put those. But Ethernet is interesting because some of this is not needed anymore, by the way. Okay. So the preamble here is you'll see the alternating sequence of bits that was meant to synchronize everybody on the network when everybody had a shared common ethernet, right? The old, I don't know if people ask this anymore, but CSMA is, um, it's carrier sense media act. So it, you share the medium, but you have to see and listen if anybody's using the wire before you can transmit. And so that synchronization happens through this preamble. Uh, and then this is a start field delimiter. And so this is basically ethernet's way of saying, anybody out there? Nobody's out there. Okay, I'm going to start transmitting. Everybody make sure your clock is synced so we can all agree um, on the sequence byte. Um, fun fact, in the old, old days, okay, in the old days, I, I got this question a lot. When we had physical sniffers with physical NICs that were capable of picking up all of this on the wire, I would often get asked, hey, I have this MAC address of 5555, I think it was, or 0A, 0A, 0A. Who the hell is that? I don't have that MAC address. Well, depending on which um, bit you caught, so it could be 101010, convert that to hex. Or if you missed the first bit here, 010101, do the math on in hex and see what that um, turns out to be. Okay, so these were preambles that the sniffers were picking up. Okay, um, so, oh, it looks like Andrew, yeah, I think that's Charles Spurgeon uh, years ago. Wow, that's that's cool, Anders. That's, uh, I love to meet that guy. He had a, if you read that book and you don't understand Ethernet, you really need to go flip burgers because that is one of those uh, industry Bibles on how Ethernet really works. So interframe gap time. This is um, quiescent time. This is a, that Ethernet needed to, do some housekeeping. Back in the days, we didn't have super fast computers. The NICs weren't that powerful. So you needed some quiet time in between. So everybody could update their counters, clear the registers, get ready for the next packet, et cetera. And that's 9.6 microseconds of time. This is measured in time, uh, but it's not. So let me go further by saying, why did I bring this up? Because it when, when you're calculating how much bandwidth you have to transmit. In Wireshark, we're primarily concerned with this, okay? Source destination, what kind of, is it TCP? Is it, what is the ether type here and the data? 99% of the time we're in here. But if you're looking for congestion and you're looking for delay in between packets, you have to account for this and this because these things happen in the real world. Okay, 9.6 microseconds of dead time and eight bytes of preamble star field delimiter. And of course the VLAN tag, if you have it, okay? You have to account for that. So why do I bring this up? Because you need to understand and spot differences in the real world. So what do I have here? I have a simple spreadsheet. It's all it is, is um, I take the bytes converted to bits, okay? And just multiply by eight to get the number of bits. Then I have the speed of the network, 10 gigabit, 1 gigabit, 100. And for old nostalgic reasons, um, T1 here. As a, well, I guess I should have put E1 here, right? This is European um, shark vest. So not T1, but E1, which has a 2 megabit speed. The, um, and then this is how much byte we have bytes per second, because uh, application people use bytes per second. Network people use bits per second. So I put that in there. The time to serialize, this is important. So the time to serialize is um, how long it takes to get on the wire and go across given the 10 gigabit, one gigabit, 100 gigabit and T1 speed, okay? So you can see here it's very, in, in 10 gigabit, it doesn't take much at all to get on the wire. And at one gigabit, it's a little bit smaller. And then you hear, so you see here at 100 megabit, it's, um, the first three are milliseconds and microseconds, et cetera, okay? You see that 9.6? So if I go back to my presentation, look at that 9.6 microseconds, okay? So essentially interframe gap time of 9.6 means that you're transmitting 12 bytes 
worth of time um, for, so you have 12 bytes, that's 9.6 microseconds, but that's not at one gigabit or 10 gigabit, okay? Because notice how, you know, just simple math of 100 to gigabit to 10 gigabit, this orders of magnitude increase. And so the uh, uh, interframe gap time goes down. As you go to a faster network, the micro uh, gap time is 9.6 microseconds. Does that make sense? Anyway, I just wanted to give you, so why do I have this? Because if we have, if we're transmitting 1500 byte MTU packets, these are the delays you will see because you can't get around these delay because this is how long it takes to stuff that 1500 byte packet into that wire. You need a minimum of this much time, this much time, this much time, and this much time, depending on the speed, okay? So this is the serialization delay that you should see. And in fact, in one of um, Jasper's sessions in the back in the past, and others have mentioned this too, when you see a common delay like this, you can kind of guesstimate or estimate what kind of physical medium you were dealing with because these delays do not go away, okay? Because they're physical limitations of the wire that needs to be transferred. Okay, hopefully that made sense. Let's go back to our presentation here. A uh, couple more things. You have to be careful, okay? Um, when you're capturing from the network, you have to understand that serialization applies to your sniffer too, because your sniffer requires a network to serialize or stuff those packets into a net outbound port and stuff it to your uh, PCAP collector here. So this is a large sniffer. If you have an old design like this, where a server is dual homed for redundancy with two different switches and two different routers, this is kind of the old way of designing this, old, old way of designing networks. Um, the, so this is server's perspective. The clients over here come to the server this way. Okay, so this gets spanned to here. And these are requests, so they tend to be small. And the delay here, when you take all the requests going to the server and use port mirror to, or um, port mirror to here, then the queue here isn't that bad. But when the server is sending a lot of data, the reply to the clients this way, and this port is being uh, sent to this sniffer port here, you can see the serialization here is longer. Why? Because these are small packets, you know, get, and the packet's small. So the time to serialize a small packet is this much. Okay, so this is the wire, takes this much to push it through. Now on the right side here, the packets are bigger. So when you drain that packet to the wire, it takes longer, which means your sniffer is going to have a different time. And in fact, it's, it's, if you have this arrangement, you may see a future packet. Um, so you may see an ACK to a packet you didn't see because just from a sniffer's perspective, you can get 100 of these packets for every 10 packets that you see here, okay? So be careful. You have to understand why serialization delay matters. The other one is at 10 gigabit. I've mentioned this before, but you need to understand uh, the serialization and propagation delay that can happen. So here's a server that you're trying to monitor and I'm paying homage to Riverbed here. This is uh, an icon for uh, shark appliance. Maybe it's an ARX now. Um, anyway, so when the server is doing its duplex, right? Transmit, receive. Uh, typically we monitor or um, span it you use one port. So right away, you're probably gonna have some packet loss here if you have a um, transmit and receive that's, that's kind of saturating the network here because your outbound is the same 10 gig, but here it's really 20 gig because it's 10 gig inbound, 10 gig outbound. We understand that, that's easy to understand. But here's the thing, this network is 20 meter fiber. And then, um, so the distance from this switch to this server is 20 meters, and you have 95 um, nanoseconds of propagation delay. Because remember, it takes from point A to point B. If you look at the medium fiber optic, in this case, it's 0.95 nanoseconds. But here, the fiber to your sniffer is 50 meters long. It's not unusual. 
when you ask a data center people to rack and stack, they just grab a fiber patch panel and they string it up. It may, they may take you to a couple of racks over where you have all your sniffers racked and stacked. And so you, you might have longer or shorter cables. That means you're seeing something that's different than the real world because there's an artificial delay that was introduced um, for the snap mirror packets to go to the sniffer. Okay. Now, 99% of the time, this doesn't come into play, okay? Unless you work for a financial and you're working on a trading platform. Then before you troubleshoot trading floors um, where nanoseconds can come into play, make sure you understand what the real world things looks like in terms of propagation delay, okay? If you really want to troubleshoot something um, that like high frequency trading, you have to understand the cable length. If you don't, you're probably not going to have much luck in troubleshooting. Okay, another view of this, and I, this is an important concept. So we'll get to packets here in about, in a couple of minutes here. Uh, a different look at how, so in, so this is a client transmitting to the server. Uh, at time zero, I start to transmit here and I receive the first packet here at 100 milliseconds. So um, you can see it's 50 milliseconds this way, 50, or actually, I'm sorry, 100 milliseconds this way, 100 milliseconds this way. So this 100 millisecond one-way um, delay. So this is the first, so this is the beginning of the packet, end of the packet. This is the serialization delay, okay? So this is how long it takes to, so here's the wire. Here's the packet. This is how long it takes to drain. Uh, that's considered a serialization delay. Obviously, 10 millisecond, phenomenally big um, serialization delay, but just for sake of um, visualization, I made it 10 milliseconds, okay? Um, so this, how long it takes to go from left to right is the propagation delay and the amount of time it takes to send, uh, put this into the wire is the serialization delay, okay? Hopefully that was clear. Now let's look at our first packet trace. And before I do that, I'm gonna just quickly, um, okay, no other questions. So let's move on. Uh, there is one um, question. I think Sake you know, asked uh, to everybody here, what's the propagation delay between copper fiber and microwave? So it's copper fiber microwave in that order. It's a speed of light. Um, it's a speed of light before, it's a function of speed of light and electrical, depending on whether it's copper or fiber. And uh, if you just Google the propagation transmission speed of um, one, two, you know, copper versus uh, fiber. And remember there's multi-mode, single mode too. Uh, and uh, microwave, you'll get those numbers. Okay, those are absolute uh, rooted in physics. Okay. Um, and Christian said, yeah, how can you be sending ACT before uh, receiving the full packet? It is, it's, uh, except this is, you know, not to scale. I, I was, I was going to put not to scale at the top because I knew one of you guys would go, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. Um, but it's, um, it's, it looks better. But it was just uh, when I was moving the, the lines, it snapped to the wrong uh, snap point. But good catch, Christian. All right. Um, so we reviewed this. So spreadsheet, again, this is very simple spreadsheet, nothing to uh, write home about. And I'll go ahead and save it. All right, now let's look at our first packet trace. So this is a very strange packet trace file. Why is it strange? Well, this is a um, couple of things that about this trace that annoys me. Uh, as soon as you see this, something like this, you go, ah, crap. Well, the first thing is, look at the port number, 1494, it's ICA. Um, any kind of VDI solution, and I'm not, you know, uh, talking trash about ICA, any kind of VDI solution is hard to troubleshoot because it's a user interaction, your keystrokes, how fast you type, how much you move the mouse, how much there's blinking and going on on the screen, all affect how many packets you're gonna see and what the interaction is like. What I mean is it's not fixed like a transactional, transactional. When I say get, okay, HTTP get, I know that there's going to be a bunch of files coming down and I can measure that. And it's a good way to measure um, 
and look at things like, is there delayed acknowledgement involved here? Is there Nagel involved here? Um, there's a lot of heuristics you can bring when you have full coming back in chunks. With ICA, that goes out the door, okay? Because if I don't type, I may not be sending packets. If I don't have a one sec, so if you see on my screen here, I have a one second timer. If I don't have that, and I just sit here without that one second timer going, ICA may only have heartbeat to send because the screen isn't changing, okay? Never mind adding voice to uh, Citrix or VDI solution that adds yet another layer of uh, complexity to this. So when you're troubleshooting Citrix or VDI, be aware of that, okay? A lot of the things that we rely on, you can't, um, you can't use, okay? These delays may be entirely legitimate or they may not. Okay? And that's why it's annoying to troubleshoot VDI. So the first thing here we see is that the server 10 dot talking to a client 192. Uh, we don't have the Cincinnati. This is a, a huge trace file that I chopped it down to interesting parts. So what's our round trip? Can we even figure out what our round trip time is? Um, we can kind of sort of kind of guess at it, but we can't be 100% sure. If I had a packet request going this way and I see uh, four full-size MTU packets coming this way, I can guarantee you uh, to tell you what that exact round trip time is. And I can even tell you if I'm on the, the side of the, of the 10 dot or if I'm on the side of the 192. With um, ICA and, and you know the VDI, it's not 100%, okay? You can guess, but you can't. Um, so here's what I mean. So at beginning of time, I see um, this is time zero, beginning of the packet capture. Server sends something to the packet. Uh, let me try that again. Server sends some packet, 43 bytes of data to the client. That's my time zero. I don't know what happened before this. Then sometime later, 47 milliseconds later, I see what? Acknowledgement come back, okay? So I can rule a couple of things out. I know that the client 192.16 isn't doing Nagel, okay? Nagel is where you wait for additional packets or delay, I'm sorry, Nagel is where you try to not send small packets. You wanna to try to queue them up as much as you can. And the delayed act is, I'm not gonna acknowledge you unless you send me two full MSS or two packets in a row. Uh, I know that because within 47 milliseconds, I got an act back. And most of delayed act timers are 100, 200, um, like that. Heuristic, you know, this is just, um, experience, not anything written in stone, because you can change the delayed act timer. You can even turn it off if you want. So I'm going to assume we're about 47, 50 milliseconds round trip time. Okay. Then look at the delta here. A full one second later, he sends, the server sends 35 bytes and acknowledges um, the fact that he saw this. Okay. Sometime in the past, we have um, acknowledgement number that we need to send. So I send acknowledgement one here, okay? And remember, the reason why I say some acknowledgement here is because I don't know what happened before this time. There could have been transfers that are going on. This is chopped up trace file. So anyway, I, what I do know is that the client sent a client acknowledged and the server waited one second uh, to trans, transmit 40, uh, 35 bytes. Is that one second really long? Is it hard? Is it unusual? I don't know. It's ICA. If you have a long trace file, though, when you look at it, you will get a feel for what's normal, what's not normal. Okay. Um, and uh, Andre here says Linux uses 40 millisecond delay nowadays. Um, so, you know, keep in mind that these are good heuristics to know and fingerprint the OS so that you can see um, what you're up against. All right. So, uh, one second. Okay interesting, but maybe a problem, maybe not a problem. So let's follow this trace, okay? And let's see what the server is doing. So the, uh, the acknowledgement comes back for this packet here, this the 35 bytes, the client positively acknowledges that and says, I got that. And it again, took 49 milliseconds. So we have pretty good evidence here pointing to that round trip is probably 49, 50 milliseconds. Why is it 47 and 49? 
congestion, jitter on the network. Um, I'm not gonna, right? That's completely normal to have a one or two milliseconds of delay when you're using uh, the internet. All right, so we're caught up here in terms of the client saying, yeah, I got you. I'm good up to a packet three. I got everything that I need. Then the server says, all right, I'm gonna send you some more, okay? So look at the sequence number. So uh, the, the way I do my sequence number analysis is I'm at 44, I'm gonna send 35 bytes. So the next 35 bytes, so the next time I start is 44 plus 35 or 79, next sequence number. Okay, I, I like to put that in a column. Then here I start at 79 because I said the next expected sequence number I'm gonna start with is 79. So I start with 79 and I go to 114 because I'm sending yet another 35 bytes. That's good. But then a retransmission happens here, 79 to 114 sequence number. It's the same packet. All right, retransmissions happen or do they? Why did this guy retransmit? How do we know there was packet loss? How do we know something went wrong with this guy other than a retransmission occurred? But remember in a modern day transfer, we have what's called fast retransmit. When the other side gives us three duplicate acknowledgements, we retransmit immediately. But there's another kind of retransmission and this is retransmission timeout, meaning I waited long enough I didn't hear from you. I'm going to assume the packet was lost and I'll transmit that packet. Okay. And the way to see that is to um, remember this is delta from previous packet. This is the, the time since the beginning of the capture. When this happens, when this retransmission happens, it's easy, some easier sometimes if you hit control T and make this the new time reference. Okay. So I'm going to hit control T. And it says time reference. Now, my time here is since this packet, not up here. Okay. And immediately it jumps out three, nine. What, why is that significant? Because this seems like it's a back off time of I transmitted this. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. waiting ah, crap, I think this packet got lost because you, 192.168, haven't given me any kind of feedback whatsoever. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume the packet got lost and I'm gonna retransmit here because my timer expired. So I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. And again, look how much time I wait this time, 600 milliseconds. So I waited 300 milliseconds this time I'm waiting 600 milliseconds, okay? Again, this is that, that back off where I double each time because the algorithm doubles every time because there's no sense in asking and retransmitting if you think there's congestion, you're just adding to the congestion by being chatty and sending packets over and over. This seems normal. This is um, some kind of uh, stoppage, some kind of uh, uh, network event because in the, in the network world, Look at the time elapsed from time reference here to this guy here. That's almost one second. There is no router in the world that holds on to packets for one second. And as network people, you have to let the application people know that one second to a network person is an almost an eternity, okay? Because the round trip from US to Australia isn't the high to almost 300, 278, 290 milliseconds or so. So I can go from US, New York to Australia three times. That's how much one second is. Even if I go out to space, to outer space is 300, 200 to 500 milliseconds, depending low earth orbit or high orbit. So I can go to space and back in that one second. Okay, that's how much time it is. So this is an impossible amount of time. So we can assume there was some kind of blockage it wasn't just congestion, this was a complete blockage of traffic because for one second, I'm seeing nothing but the 10 dot server trying to send, 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 okay? Now I have one more clue here to add. Chances are I'm closer to the 10 dot, um, I'm capturing closer to the 10 dot 
than I am to 192, 168. How do I know that? Because if I were on the other side, I probably wouldn't have seen these packets, okay? So the, the look of region versus I'm not hearing anything or missing packets, uh, the, the look changes whether you're on the sender side or the receiver side. Again, I had sessions in the past SharkFest that goes into that and others, other SharkFest participants have shown you um, why retransmission looks different from source versus destination. Okay, so far, things are normal, right? Packet loss happened, co network collapse happens, maybe the network is rerouting, maybe there's an internet outage, who knows? It's perfectly a fine, it happens. So again, the same 35 bytes, start at 79, next, se next sequence number 114, next, again, the 30, same 35 bytes, again, the same 35 bytes, then this is where things go a little wonky. Normally, when you have complete packet loss here, okay, are you allowed to transfer the next stream that's in the queue? So look at the look at the um, the packet progression here. Okay, I start at sequence number forty four to seventy nine. That's fine. Then I pick up seventy nine to one fourteen. That's fine. So the next time I transmit, I'm going to start with 114 and I go to 141, 27 bytes. That's fine. But normally when you have complete retransmission timeout and back off like this, you don't typically see the server or anybody sending the next one. Are you not allowed to send that? Not really, because if you look at the window size, there is window size here. Okay, meaning the window is 254, probably not 254 because um, the window scaling factor is not here. So, but even if it's 254, okay, let's assume that this is like the worst server in the world, worst client in the world, and my window size is 254. So one, so I'm sorry, 192.168, let's look at 192.168 window size, 960. So even in worst case scenario, the client, the last time I heard from the client, he's saying, I'm good. My bucket says I can receive 960 more bytes of data. So I only sent 35 here, right? And retransmit retransmission. And I'm only sending another 27 here. So in, even in the absolute worst case scenario, the receiver 192168 has enough window size that allows me to transmit this as well, okay? It's unusual though, because most in most cases, uh, after this, something bad happens and uh, the connection will break. Or is there another explanation here? What other explanation could account for, I'm stuck, I'm stuck, I'm stuck. Ah, you know what? I'll send the next one in the queue. What could that other explanation be? Maybe we got an acknowledgement from 192.168 and the sniffer lost it. Or the acknowledgement came, but maybe the acknowledgement got lost, never made it to the sniffer. Okay, think about that. Remember, when you're troubleshooting, you can't jump to conclusions. You have to rule out every last piece of uh, thing that makes you go, hmm. So let's take a look at this guy again. So here's a packet, packet, I sent it, I sent it. I'm sending the next one in the queue, which is odd behavior. Maybe my conjecture is that maybe I missed an acknowledgement coming from 192.168.1.1 simply because the sniffer didn't pick it up. Is there a way to check that? Build a circumstantial evidence and case for saying that maybe I got the acknowledgement. Well, maybe, maybe you can, maybe you can't. So let's rule it out. One way we can tell from afar how many people the other guy's doing is that Marcus was Johnny on the spot saying IP ID could help here, okay? Uh, well done, Marcus, because IP ID can kind of tell how busy the other guy is, even though I'm remote here. What do I mean by that? Let's go back to packet number two here and open up IP ID. Oops, sorry, Ethernet ID. And his IP ID is 16594. Remember, he may be talking to other TCP, he may have other sockets open um, and 
the other conversations all come from the same pool of IP ID. So this isn't foolproof by any means. Sometimes you get lucky though. So here's IP ID of 594. The next time I see, so remember it's 94, the last two digits is 94. The next packet that we see is 95. Hey, we're in luck. It's it incremented by one. Okay. Then here, this is the after that uh, 141 being sent. I look here. So remember it's 94, 95, and here's 97. So let me do that again. 95, oh, I'm sorry, 94, 95, not 96, but 97. So between here and here, the IP ID jumped by two. Now, here's a problem with IP ID. You can't, this isn't a slam dunk because maybe that 192.168 guy was sent one packet to somebody else. So this is my conversation. He's talking to somebody else. This is my IP ID 94, 95, 96, 97, okay? I don't know. At the same time, this is VDI. So when you're doing VDI, you tend to stay in that VDI tunnel and you may even be using a dumb terminal, right? Little pizza box terminal. So maybe the other guy won't be talking to anybody else, but who knows? However, it does add credence to the fact that maybe between here, 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 and here, there was an acknowledgement that we just happened to miss, right? So we're like, yeah, this is cool. IPID to the rescue again. I have more circumstantial evidence of this happening. Problem. What's the problem here? So everybody take a look at the screen and say, okay, this is unusual. This went missing, missing, missing. I decide to send the next one in the queue, but I think, I, I think the sniffer just didn't catch the act that came back. Um, and we have circumstantial evidence because the IP ID from here and here jumped by two, not by one. So maybe the missing guy was that ACK. Okay, sounds good. The problem is the very next packet. And it happens a second, one second after that, no less. This packet cranks the sequence number back down to 79 but this time it goes to 141. So you might be thinking, wait a minute, Hansang, here it's, I'm starting at 79, TCP sequence number starting, starting at 79, sending, what is it, 35, 35 bytes of data, 79 plus 35 is 114. So this is a 35 byte data packet, 35 byte, 35 byte. Uh, I'm sending some additional 27 bytes, next expected sequence number 141. And then I go back to 79 to 141. What the hell happened here? Well, this is the retransmission. I kind of call it cumulative retransmission. So what this is telling me is that this packet got lost too. So now as a sender, I'm like, you know what? This 35 byte got lost. I tried sending it two more times. Then I tried sending 27 bytes of data. It looks like that got lost too. So I'm going to retransmit from the last known good, which is 79. And now I'm at 141 because I sent 35 and 27 here. So the sequence number jumps from 79 to 141 and it took one second. Why is this significant? Because that acknowledgement never got to us, not at this point in time. Because if that acknowledgement came to us, I wouldn't be going back all the way back to 79. I would be going back to 114 to... Um, Oops, sorry. Yeah, 114 to 141, okay? Does that make sense? Let me repeat that one more time. If these packets got lost and we got an acknowledgement that we just happened to miss, okay, I'm gonna transmit the next byte that's in the queue, the 27 bytes here. That's fine, that makes sense so far. But then this packet disproves that theory that there was a missing act because I went all the way back to the missing 35 bytes here, plus the 27 that you see here, and this retransmission happens here. Okay, make sense?
So maybe it was a timing, a, a race condition that we just happened to catch the acknowledgement and the other guy was just sending. Because remember, my sniffer isn't at the server, it's somewhere in the middle. So it's, it is possible that I missed the act, he got, the server got the act, he started to retransmit, but then the timing doesn't work out. Why? Because, and this is the important part. It's been a full one second, okay? There is no way this acknowledgement, this mysterious missing acknowledgement went missing for one full second. Okay. Then what happens is um, we see the, um, the server trying to send more data like, okay, maybe I got caught up, maybe, I don't know. Maybe that's that missing byte. Maybe the missing byte got caught up at 141, okay? Because now I see three additional packets going out uh, of the server. So maybe I have to re redo my thinking here and say three byte, three times I try to send. Uh, I try to send this one too, it was missing. So I transmitted to here. I got an acknowledgement back saying, uh, I'm good up to pack, uh, sequence number 141. And that's what allowed the server to send this many packets again. But then what happens? The client says, the server says, I'm out because all these retransmission, look at the times that are occurring here. And the server says, eh, I'm out. Okay, I'm done talking to you because I've waited too long. Uh, you haven't answered me back and therefore I will reset the connection. Now, this acknowledgement number here going wonky here, this is an artifact of um, anonymization. Because if you look at this here, this packet, my sequence number is 89149854. The acknowledgement number is 89149854. Well, is it possible that my sequence number matches exactly what I'm supposed to be acknowledging to the other side? Yeah, it could happen, um, but not likely. And so this is just... Uh, the packet getting a little bit corrupted during um, anonymization or packet just got mangled along the way, but it's more, I think, due to anonymization. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so this is why I call it very strange because this behavior of packet loss, packet loss, packet loss, eh, what the hell? I'll send the next one in the queue anyway. Ah, no, let me rewind all the way back to 79 and restart and catch up this and this packet. And then maybe there was a miss, uh, missing acknowledgement that we came back. So I'm, I decided to send more. And then the guy, st the acknowledgement starts to come back and then it goes, the connection gets reset, okay? Um, so <laughs> Jesper just mentioned. Um, so Jesper, this wasn't, um, you're right, but I didn't use um, Trace Wrangler on this. I did use it, but before I used it, I used um, the other tool that used to be there. Uh, what, what the hell was that called? The CLI one that you had to use. Um, yeah, so the other tool broke at first and I, I since lost the original. All right, uh, so Tra Trace Wrangler basically just replicated what was broken by the, the CLI one that, uh, that was used. All right, so let's look at another example of um, packet lost happening. And this one um, is, we're, it's, we're a little bit lucky here because I see sin synac happening here. So this is a file transfer, slowness, congestion, packet loss, et cetera. Okay, so sin synac and the, the usual, the sin synac here, and then out of order, TCP out of order, what the hell is that? Um, and then why is there a reset here? So why is TCP out of order on a sin synac handshake? What the hell is going on? So the first thing I'll do is I just like to double check, look at the conversation pair, make sure I'm not conflating two different conversations. That happens a lot. You're like, oh, why did this jump so much here? And then looking at two different TCP streams. So I know there's two streams here, 192.168.1.1 and, and going to the server. But this is odd, right? Because if you look at the relative start, uh, the duration was 32 milliseconds here. And this one is 242 seconds. That's awesome. Source, destination, port number are the same. That's unusual because there's a half-life associated with sockets and you're not supposed to just reuse the same socket number um, 
right away, okay? Because there's a, in the TCP state diagram, you do go into half close and whatnot. But if we look at here, why is there a TCP out of order? What the hell is that about? So let's take a look at that a little bit more carefully. So this is, if I come down here, sin, and he's saying uh, early congestion notification, and um, so other TCP options are set, window size looks okay. And here are the options here, okay? These are the TCP, my maximum segment size, uh, this is just a filler. I'm going to do window scale and uh, I'm going to do selective acknowledgement time set. Very, very normal. Then this guy says SYNAC. Okay, again, very normal. But the next packet is also SYNAC. What the hell just happened here? Why is there, why are there two SYNACs? Okay. Did I duplicate a packet? Is that what happened? Well, if it's a duplicate packet that I captured, then we can also look at the IP ID field to see if they're the same. Again, building evidence that this is the same packet. So if we go to the first packet, it's IP ID 44557, and this IP ID is 12942. So this is completely different IP um, ID. There's something else that's different too. I don't know if you noticed that and caught that when I went back and forth here. Okay. Look at the field down here, and you can see things changing that shouldn't be changing if these are the same packets. Okay, look at my DSCP value here. It's changing between these two guys, all right? And if I come down to my, um, the, C, the TCP flags here, you can see that Cincinnati uh, congestion notification, Cincinnati congestion notification, window size 8192, window size, where's my window size? 8192. Okay, so window size is the same, IP ID is different, and um, Ethernet DSCP is different. So somebody, there's a bump in the wire, maybe there's a proxy, maybe there's um, something in the middle that got in the way and created another Ethernet packet on behalf of uh, 10 dot, okay? Which is entirely possible because remember, if I'm capturing from here, which I am, Right? Because if we look at the SYN SYN ACK, I sent the SYN, beginning of time, I sent the SYN, I get an ACK back 31 milliseconds later, and the other guy, uh, I acknowledge or reset the connection, but the time is almost instant. So I'm at 192.168, I'm closer to 192.168 as I'm capturing it. So, okay, so something on the ethernet happened, um, who knows, okay? Maybe something happened. Maybe that's why the, the 182.168 did a reset and went, ah, I'm out. What the hell? Why are you sending me uh, two different Synax? But then 182.168 does something weird because he reuses that uh, TCP port number. Okay. And decides to send this in. Now, this is unusual because he's not living by the uh, TCP state diagram of waiting, you know, fin weight and, and whatnot. Um, so, okay, so that's kind of weird, but weird things happen. But the next packet is just one SYNAC. Okay, you can see the SYNAC coming back. So we can ignore the first port packets. Let's start the analysis from here, okay? And um, there was a question about, hey, what is there a change in the TTL between packet two and three, the duplicate packets? So TTL is another signature that you can use, time to live, uh, to see if um, different stack touched it because different stacks use different time to live. So packet number two is 128 and packet number is 128, okay? So that's also a good uh, forensics that you can use to see if, um, remember, I always say this, you know, when you're doing packet analysis, you're trying to get a murder conviction without a body, okay? You can only use circumstantial evidence and getting a murder conviction without a body is tough because all the defense has to say is he went on vacation. My, the victim went on vacation, proved that he didn't go on vacation. Therefore, reasonable doubt. Um, okay. And uh, I'll just tell you one quick joke. So the defense attorney tells the jury, um, reasonable doubt, um, my, my client didn't convict, could not have convicted uh, the, the person that he's accused of killing because ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the victim is going to walk in the door right now. And all the jury went like that. Okay. But they still convicted him. 
So the, the lawyer said, how did you convict this guy when all of you looked at the door, which means you had reasonable doubt? You believed me when I said the victim was going to walk in the door. And the juror says, yeah, but your client didn't look. <laughs> okay. So anyway, I, I was that gives me a chuckle. So let's get back to the package race here. Sin, sin, act, act. Awesome. Everything's normal. Window size is fine. Uh, I'm sending one through 119. Uh, I'm sending a byte here. So let's go back to close the internet protocol here. I'm sending 118 bytes. So the normal sequence number analysis, one to 119, 119, 176, 176, 176. Okay, fine. ACK. Um, this is just a naked ACK. 170, again, ACK. 176 to 190. That's good. Um, and... 190 to 253, 253 to 253, and so on and so forth, okay? So that looks good. Then down here, we start to see retransmission and spurious retransmission. Why, what's a spurious retransmission? Well, you can look at prior sessions by Jasper that talks about the difference between retransmission, retransmission timeout, and fake or spurious uh, retransmission. So let's delve into this a little bit more, okay? So let's go to packet 59 here. So clearly the 192.168 guy is trying to send something and um, he can't. Let me close this. And this is a 1432 byte packet that he's trying to send again and again. So remember the sequence number here, 3187 to 4619, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, notice the doubling of time. So let's go to here, control T, um, almost 500 milliseconds, almost a second, 1.8, 3.6, 7.7. So I'm backing off, doubling, doubling, doubling. And then finally a reset will probably occur here, okay? But there's something else that's interesting about this trace file. This isn't, so A, we understand that there's probably a complete blockage, right? Because I'm sending, 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 sending. And I don't see any kind of feedback coming back from the 10 dot guy. So 192.168 is sending, 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 sending. Uh, and the server doesn't send anything back. Chances are, this is a good indication that there's a complete blockage, complete um, uh, um, blockage of network or it's rerouting, but it's probably not rerouting because rerouting event doesn't take five, 10 seconds, typically modern day network, okay? And Marcus makes a good point that IP ID is not in IPv6, and that's very true. In fact, a lot of people, a lot of vendors lobbied for I inclusion of IP ID, and uh, they said, no, we're not gonna use it. Okay, but, but in IPv6, to be fair, there's a lot more information that can be used uh, to, for troubleshooting. All right, so um, let's come back to here and let's figure out what's going on here. Okay, so let's come back to here and let's look at, let's close out the internet uh, protocol and let's look at the sequence number of what exactly went wrong with 192.168's transmission, uh, starting with say here. Okay, so I transfer, uh, I'm at 273, I transfer 747 bytes, 2822, that's good. And then I go to 2820 to 2820. This is just an acknowledgement. I'm not sending anything back. Everything's good here. And then here I'm sending 367 bytes. So I move my next expected sequence number by 367 bytes to 3187, that's good. And I get an acknowledgement for this packet. So 57 and 59, Everything looks good, right? Because this guy is acknowledging like, yeah, I got it. Uh, I'm good uh, up to 3187. Go ahead and start it at 3187. I'm at 3187 here. Bah, here's something odd. Look at the size, 7160, okay? And you might think, wow, this is probably just TCP offloading. So the IP stack is uh, able to send as big a packet as it wants. And yeah, that, that, that could be it. Um, but also it, it, maybe not. Okay, there are ways to, to look at that uh, by looking at the packet size and ethernet behavior and whatnot. But this could also be a jumbo frame. Why jumbo frame? Because um, when you have 8K, 9K, you know, jumbo size uh, is in that range, obviously 9K. Um, so if this was 16K here, I can rule out jumbo frame because there's no jumbo frame at 16K or even 10,000 bytes right? Because I, I now know I'm not dealing with a physical uh, Ethernet jumble, but 97160 could still be a legitimate jumbo frame. I don't know. Okay. All right. So put that in our cap and we keep going. 
and the client says, um, I'm at, I was at 3187, I'm sending you something uh, 14 bytes, okay? So I get a, this isn't a feedback per se, this is the 10 dot guy, he had something to send, so he used the last act that he had, which is 3187. All right, then here, um, let's look at here, what's going on here? Hmm. So why is this a spurious transmission? this 10 dot guy, and what the hell is going on here? Let's take a look. What is that? Why? Okay, 72,000 bytes, 7160 bytes. Um, my next expected sequence number is 10, 3, 4, 7. And this 10 dot guy says 890 to 904, length 14. Let's come over to here and 890 to 904, it's the same packet. 890, 904, 890, 904. So I'm gonna come back to here. Well, is it the same packet? Probably not a duplicate, right? Because the amount of time, but let's just double check. So the first one is 28062. The next one is 62883. Okay, so it's I know it's not a duplicate. In fact, this 10 that guy is pretty booking because at a minimum, his IP ID went up from 28,000 to 62,000. It could have wrapped around because that is limited, right? The number of bytes of IPID is limited. So it could have wrapped around even, but I know that at least it went up by 4,000 other packets. So why is this a spurious retransmission? If I go to here and set it to time reference of two, he sent the retransmission Why is it a spurious retransmission? Because from this guy's perspective, he didn't have any reason to resend. There wasn't a triple dupe. No one sent the triple dupe. If someone sent the triple dupe, if 10 dot guy sent the triple duplicate, um, I would see that, right? Then that would be a fast retransmission. But I know it's not a fast retransmission. You know why? Because it took almost 200 milliseconds for him to retransmit. So I can say, well, okay, that was a timeout retransmission timeout that could have occurred. And that's why the 10 dot guy decided to send it again. All right, makes sense, right? Because, or uh, keep in mind that I'm capturing from 192.168 perspective, right? Okay, so between here and here, I don't know what the 10 dot sent in addition to this. I just know that I got this packet, um, I acknowledged it. And then even though I acknowledged it, okay, and this is the key point, I acknowledged up to 904, next expected sequence number. I acknowledged you. Why the hell are you sending me another retransmission? Okay. I acknowledged you. So you, there was no reason for you to have sent this packet. It, unless, unless this acknowledgement that I sent got lost. Okay. If, remember, the, remember I said the view of a transmitter versus the receiver looks different. So now I'm at the transmitter side and I sent this and maybe it got lost. If it got lost, maybe it's an MTU problem, right? Because it's 70K, uh, assuming that this is a jumbo frame and not uh, TCP offloading. And a couple of, um, and Andy asked, maybe other side due to DF bit not being set. Okay, so let's, Take a look here. Okay. And um, so maybe path MTU kicks in and says, hey, uh, packet too large, you need to fragment, but you don't have don't fragment bit set. Um, so adjust your MTU size, please. Could that have happened? Well, if I come down to here, it chops the 7,000 packets, right? Instead of sending the full 7,000 byte packet, he comes down to here and cranks it all the way down to 1432. So we have empirical evidence that this 192.168 guy got the notification saying, hey, 7,000 is too large. So we know that this is not a TCP offloading event because if this was a TCP offloading event, in reality, that would have fit into an ethernet MTU and it would have been transferred, okay? That's not what happens here. I send a 7,000K, 7K byte, of data and I get some kind of feedback, I guess, because 1432, it chops it down to 1432. 
I know it's the, it's the exact same packet because my starting point of 3187 is here, 3187 is here, uh, it's 1432, but I can't get this guy through. And try and try and try, and you notice a doubling of time here. I keep trying and the packet gets lost. This is a complete blockage of the network, okay? You, what you have to do at this point is you now have proof positive that between 192.168 and 10 dot, something wonky is going on because the return traffic here, there was two Synax coming. So there is some device in the network. I know this for a fact, a proxy firewall or something else that uh, modified my, because I see two Synax with different signatures and my 7,000 byte that I tried to send um, got chopped up, blocked, and I tried to crank it down and it still didn't get through. Now, the question is, why didn't I get my ICMP type three code four message, packet to a large fragment? Well, because I don't, I didn't do this capture. The person could have typed in the, uh, in the PCAP sniffer or, or a TCP dump between you know, source to this guy only. Okay, so if your filter was host 10.10.10.10.1, .10 .10 .10 .10 the ICMP that comes back doesn't come from 10.10.10.1. ICMP comes from someone else, a router along the way that sends an ICMP packet back to you. Um, so you might've missed that or they might've filtered it out. Okay. I'm sorry, just but now I have reasonable three minutes left. information to say um, that the packet was too large and I tried to send it, uh, chop it up, but it was too late because down here we get a complete retransmission and the, and the connection resets, okay? So that jumbo frame, but the thing is, until that jumbo frame was sent, everything was good. I mean, look at the trans back and forth, back and forth here, okay? So what was the root cause? Uh, jumbo frame freaking out a switch, causing it to reboot, jumbo frame causing uh, to um, cause something, um, uh, break and, and reboot the router and switch. And that's why it took so long. And Jim has point of, hey, what was the maximum segment, segment size here? So let's take a look. It says 1460 and the Synac says. Um, Hans Song, just a heads up. There's about two minutes left till the oh, end. Oh, okay. So two minutes. So when you get this packet trace file, take a look at Jim's point is um, that you can look at the maximum segment size. But the problem with maximum segment size is that the routers along the path can also interfere because there's a TCP MSS adjust, okay? So the point here is that when you're doing a packet trace file, the, the, the difference, the look of the feel looks different when you're from the sender side and it looks different when you're on the receiver side. You can have reasonable conclusions about maybe there was an act that I missed, maybe not. So you have to compile all these things into your head as a troubleshooter and bring it back together to make a reasonable conclusion. Okay, the reasonable conclusion here is that the jumbo frame caused a disruption of some kind. Um, we know that there's a proxy or a firewall in the middle. That's probably what freaked out. And when that happened, there was a complete blockage because nothing was going after that. Okay, so that's how I would start troubleshooting is to look for uptime of devices along the, the path from 192 to 10 that guy. Okay, so um, I think I answered all the questions. So that's good. And with that, I thank you very much. And um, I'm rocking the last year's shirt because uh, I couldn't make Wireshark at the last second. Um, believe it or not, I had room. I know, right? And uh, Jasper, I think Jasper stepped in. So this time I'm rocking the t-shirt of uh, last year that I couldn't make. All right, thanks everybody. And uh, if you have any, uh, don't forget to fill out the survey form and this deck will be available uh, in, in the retrospective section. So you'll have all the links and with that, I bid you adieu. Thanks very much, everybody. Take care now. Bye-bye.